also going back to the Mises Institute for their research conference in March. And I'll be presenting on my master's work, which is the topic, the economics of suicide. And I know it's a, uh, you know, can be a morose topic, especially for a Monday morning. So I won't be offended at all if any of you are like, no, I'm just not going to do this this early in the day. You can step out. It won't offend me at all. But um, also I want to have some, like, any questions before I begin. Uh, I also want to do some questions after. Uh, about the class, or me, or Professor Gurdu, if you want. Okay, so my topic, the economics of suicide, uh, it interests me. I think it really originated from when I was here as a senior, I had an independent study with you, and I wanted to study the link between socialism and eugenics, and I think it kind of just... Uh, it ran off from that, but um, economics is existential, and to study it, I think, is something beautiful. What you study is human action, more importantly, you study civilization. And a lot of economists will, will look at capitalism and productivity and make the claim that, oh, due to increased productivity, we have higher standards of living, and life expectancy increases. And also, part of that is a decrease in infant mortality. But I don't think life is as simple as that. If you look at, uh, you know, at uh, statistics, between the ages of 10 and 34, in the US, the second leading cause of death is suicide behind accidents, which means that the second most dangerous thing to your life is yourself. And I think that's kind of uh, something very interesting and economists have to consider because why don't economists look at the influence, the variable of suicidality in society and factor that into the standards of living and well-being um, in society? As well as uh, um, the great French philosopher Albert Camus said, there's only one philosophical question and that is the question of suicide. And he really, he said that, you know, you should do with your life whatever it is that keeps you from committing suicide. And I think there's some truth to that. You have to pursue your own, your own happiness to some degree. Um, and we are kind of constrained in a world with our own limitations of what exactly we can do. But uh, I think part of that is, is um, kind of your values. And so I'm going to be jumping all over the place. I kind of just have like a lot of topics that I want to touch upon. But I'll go through kind of how I formulated my master's thesis. And um, I begin with, with human action. So Viktor Frankl, he said that he, what he called logotherapy is that people have to have meaning for what they do in life. And that that's essentially what creates a meaningful life. But it's... In the Austrian perspective, all values are subjective. So you have to kind of create your own values. And what my research looks into is kind of the combination of psychology, where you have, you know, suicidality, which is a, can take many forms, but part of it is like hatred turned against oneself or anger and frustration. And um, one, one researcher, Johan Hari, has looked at like, nine different variables for suicidality, and only two of them are psychological. The other seven are societal. So I, my estimate is that it's a lot of external societal influences that affect people and influence their decision-making process and, and lead them to act upon what they value. Okay, I'm gonna go into some of the, uh, the main points. Of, of what I've studied. The first one being, as economists, the economic system. So what the Austrians believe, and this is a, a lot of what I learned from one of my favorite dissident thinkers, Curtis Yarvin. The Austrian school of economic thought essentially says we should have a free market in everything, including finance. 
where you have the market setting interest rates. And when you have th that, you have kind of a different type of um, investment projects. But what we have today is the system where a central bank sets interest rates. And really, this is just kind of a, a mechanism for getting around fraudulent banking systems. And everyone thinks that a central banking, a central bank um, setting interest rates is like normal, but it's just not normal. But everyone thinks it's normal, um, which is quite interesting. But these, these, this has major effects, like the business cycle. So when you when you look at the business cycle, it's a correction of allocating resources to where they're most highly demanded in a market system. But when you have this intervention of, hey, we're going to allocate funds here, we're going to subsidize this, we're going to like try to, you know, in the name of conservatism, um, conservationism, excuse me, we're going to say, no, we're going to take a monopoly on this, like natural uh, resources and parks and this stuff. You have a, a shortage of this stuff. And um, this is a whole distorted atmosphere. And in the financial sector, uh, the first book that was considered to be the first book on sociology was Emil Durkheim's book uh, on suicide. And in his book, he's saying, yeah, during business cycles, you have you know this wild atmosphere of people jumping into new brackets of, of income and wealth. And it's actually the people who are like, Middle income that go to high income, that this kind of like off balances them, and they are more prone to, you know, depression, suicide, and then uh, interestingly enough, I think he points that like people in lower incomes they stay poor. It's not the most obvious that those people are the ones that do act upon suicide, um, but the whole mechanism of a business cycle and people losing jobs in productive industries. Is, is quite alarming for this type of stuff. As well as if you look at like hyperinflationary societies like uh, the Weimar Republic in 23, um, this completely, like, you gotta understand that a fiat currency is a product of socialism. So it's not this natural market phenomena produced money. It's, it's like real good money shouldn't succumb to hyperinflation in that sense. Um, the next thing I look at is, is social engineering. And this is like the militarization of society. So if you look at like the military, and I've talked to veterans, they say, yeah, they literally brainwash you. Why? Because they need you to follow orders. They need you to obey. They need you to give your life for the team you're fighting for. And this goes kind of hand in hand with uh, the public education system, which comes from the Prussian system, which is the name Volkschule. That's where the word school comes from. And Volkschule was invented in Prussia because under the monarch, too many people were running off the battlefield. So they said, hey, we need a system. Too many people are pissing their pants. They're not dying for us. What are we going to do? Well, what we're going to do is we're going to take children as kids from birth, put them in a military educational program and they will become obedient wards for the state and then you know you have to kind of like train them in this sense and uh, Prussia was the cultural and geographical precursors to the Nazis so then Horace Mann in the 1800s he's the godfather of public education said hey if we can use this for military we can use it just for making you know good citizens. But that's a euphemism for obedient, submissive, and docile. And what's interesting, I mean, this also goes into religion, which I want to further look into as far as like how that affects society and suicidality. In um, Durkheim's book, he mentions religion. He says that like the the Jewish religion and the Catholic religion have like the least amount of suicides because the religion is so intertwined with everyday life. But with more Protestantism, where you have a little bit more open inquiry to ideas, uh, there's high rates of suicide, which is quite interesting. But um, with religion, Murray Rothbard writes about this in his book, uh, Economics Before Adam Smith. 
and he talks about how communism before Karl Marx was born from Christianity, and it was a lot of uh, Christian influenced communism. And on my YouTube channel, I have a, a presentation on that. But the point being is that um, Puritanism is kind of has never gone away. And this is what one professor, Thaddeus Russell, who doesn't teach here anymore, uh, talks a lot about. But uh, Puritanism kind of is the values that we have today. So there's two main ethics of Puritanism. It's the, um, the Puritan work ethic, that you must work to not work, is to not be a good functioning citizen, and to not want to work is really bad. And also, like you, you must work and you should love what you get for it, no matter what you get for it. And also the anti-sex ethic, which is part of the nuclear family ethic. And um, Puritanism has kind of evolved into progressivism. But if you look at the 1930s, progressivism is a euphemism for communism. So like, you wouldn't say, hey, are you a fellow card carrying member? You'd say, hey, are you progressive? And what we have today is still progressives, but they're just Puritans in this kind of new sleep, I think. And um, basically, Puritanism is this idea of pure selflessness. So what you have with uh, social engineering is people looking at society as like, people are just pawns on a chessboard that we can move around. And um, you know these people need to be saved because they can't be saved on their own. And it's quite an ambitious thought, but when you look at it in practice, it's pretty nefarious. And I would say it's, uh, you know, almost, almost, just look at communism. There's a great documentary called The Soviet Story. It came out in 2008. You've got to find the one with English subtitles. But just watch that, and it's all about the Soviet Union. Um, so going back to the public education system, uh, this is part of the militarization of society. Not only that, there are day prisons for children. And I look at like prisons, for example. How many suicides do we have in prisons? The worst form of prisons are concentration camps. And like this is where I get into the morality of things, where you know people will say, "Oh, you shouldn't commit suicide," but it's like. Can you make the argument that the people who were in concentration camps, let's say during the Holocaust, who just grabbed the fence because they wanted to end it, can you blame them? No, they're prisoners, they're victims. I, I think that uh, you know they had the right to not suffer and be a victim in, in horrendous ways. So if you look at prisons and the suicide rates, I kind of try to extrapolate that to modern day society and what are the similarities between prisons and um, sort of the institutions we have today. And one of this is school. School is one of the only places children ever experience violence in their life. It's also a place where they have to you know, succumb to the authority at the front of the classroom, who can be a mediocre person. Uh, these are wards of the state. I mean, I, I know I'm in front of the classroom right now, but I try to not like make the authoritarian in that sense. Um, so yeah, children, children are forced to interact with people who are not like them, and it's a factory model. People are going from class to class, like an assembly line, and that's what it's training you for, is to be a good worker in a factory. And um, why is it that every kid has to be up at the same hour and go, you know, be flipping to the same page of the same book at the same time? It really doesn't make sense. Life is quite dynamic. Um, I encourage people, if they can, to avoid it. I mean, and you probably heard Professor Durden mention that, like, the top, you know, one percent of these people are college dropouts because they didn't, you know, succumb to the system. They created their own system, and there's there's some value to that, I think. Um, so yeah, I'm all in support of. Draft Dodgers, avoid the military. I don't think it's good for you. I don't think it will, you know, if you go to war, that's what the state wants. And really, if you look into wars and foreign policy, the wars are for central bankers. They're trying to send other people's children to die in wars. 
And as a, far as I know, I have authority over my own life and ownership over mine. So I don't think anyone has the right to tell me to go and fight in the war. Furthermore, I don't believe in the word should. And that's a lot of what this is, is if I get you to do what I want you to do, not by coercion, but by indirect creation of, of ideas that I can put into your head, then you're kind of just following what I'm doing but thinking you're a good person for doing it. And this is like virtue signaling, like people think they're good for recycling, but if you look at the carbon footprint, you're just making it like worse. It doesn't make sense, but you feel good at doing it. And it's kind of bullshit, frankly. Um, but people don't really care. They just want to be a good person. Like, like a lot of this is just uh, social engineering. And I think that's kind of the powerful thing about being open mentally to new ideas and challenging, questioning everything, is that you kind of can find your own path. And I think that's kind of the most secure way to go is just staying open to learning because, you know, if you do everything you're told to do, I, I, I don't know, I don't, I don't believe in that. But, um, yeah, the other things that I talk about are definitely um, the lockdowns. So what are lockdowns? Uh, we experienced them in 2020. This is imposed isolationism. If you look at the worst conditions of prisons, it's you put someone in uh, solitary confinement where they're isolated, they're alone. And that alone has hard, huge and large psychological influences on people. So there's been you know, a lot more suicides, depression rates going up. Um, and also for children too, like we know now that this doesn't harm children as severely as it does older generations. Yet we treat, you know, these people like we do, like they're infected people. And I think that's been a gross distortion in our society, and it's affected our values. And people have uh, thought they were a good person by like sacrificing part of their life, and to be just alive isn't enough. I think to really have freedom, you live with danger. Cars are dangerous. Um, drugs are dangerous. And yet I think all drugs should be legal. I think that it is your right as a human, as a free human being to experience life with danger in it. And the thing about drugs is that we have cartels and people are like, oh, this is the worst thing. And all you have to do is legalize the drugs, and you take all the power away from the cartels. But people are too like Puritan to be like, no, like drugs equals crimes. That's just not true. Um, so, yeah, and I don't want to see more people dying or being on fentanyl. Uh, I'm sure someone in here knows someone who who's been affected by you know depression, suicide, or drugs in a harmful way. And I think a lot of that has to do just with uh, distorted market environments. And part of this is that um, if you're a doctor, a good doctor deals with the patient in front of him. He doesn't need to know all the remedies and recipes for every possible disease. He just needs to help the patients in front of him. And I think with economists too, it's very easy to like go down the rabbit hole of like, oh, I need to know, you know everything about price theory and natural rights theory, but it's kind of like we are in this world and let's deal with the issues we see confronting us here. And I think that's part of being a good economist as well as you know, what a good doctor would do too. Um, and so with, with suicidality, it's kind of the shadow variable of life that not many economists want to talk about. But it's important to talk about because it is part of life. Uh, you know, death, death is part of life. And I, I think to put it in a light of beauty, I, I think life is beautiful and there's a lot you can do with it and make beautiful things. And so suicide is something to be confronted and, and, and shed some light on it and understand why is it that people are committing suicide. And I think a lot of it has to do more so with external societal factors. Like right now, we can replace practically every part of the human body. 
with you know surgeries and um, stuff like this. The one part we can't replace is the human mind, and a lot of that has to do with uh, with or at least helping people is giving them new ideas to consider, and that's kind of how you change human mind. And as Mises states in his treatise Human Action, all action comes from ideas, comes from the human thought and mind. And I mean, if you want to be healthy, like, yeah, it's great to you know physically exercise, but I think reading is a large part of that. I don't think reading is any different for your mind as working out is for your body. And you have to read things not only you agree with, but also disagree with. And um, things that you find challenging, and, and and I think, as Lou Rockwell said, read, read, read as much as you can. And if you read, you'll find the answers. When you find the answers, people will come to you. Um, there's probably a couple more things I want to say, but. Uh, uh, I think for right now, that's all I want to say. And I'll take some questions about anything. Maybe I can go off from there. Is, is is a currency imposed on a society not by the market but by usually the state. Um, so if you look at the history, the origins of money, it comes from you know the solving direct bartering. Whereas before, you know, if I wanted this, if you wanted this yerba mate and I wanted your pen, we'd have to find some way to exchange for this. But maybe I'm like, no, this is worth five pens. We only have three. So what we do is we find a medium of exchange to solve that uh, coincidence of wants. Where it's like, oh, maybe you give me three dollars, I'll give you this yerba, you know. But maybe I'm trying to sell it for four dollars, and that's what money is. It's a it's a product of the market. So like anything can be used for money, um, but what helps with money is just being divisible, being easy to carry, uh, having some store of value. So like wheat was money originally. Um, and then the metallic standard came along at silver and gold. And then basically what happened in 1913 with the creation of the Federal Reserve, and then in 1971 was like the state was like, okay, you know what we're gonna do? We're gonna remove the gold from the money and just print these dollars. But it's just a piece of paper. And actually there's nothing cheaper to create than pieces of paper. And we don't even create it anymore. We just push buttons and say print. And it's just, it's, it's, you know, I think it's important to look at history for economists and understand where we are at in this period of history. And when you look at the monetary system, you know, you can look at the Rothbard's book, The Mystery of, of Banking, I believe. And I think we're just going to look back on this and be like, wow, this was, this was just uh, problematic, to say the least, for many reasons. Um, but yeah, it, it's just a re allocation of the resources. So whenever we print money and it goes to the banks to go to loans, you're basically using a form of taxation, indirect taxation. And you're reallocating wealth from you know most people to the few and the friendly of the politicians, which are the banks. Um, yeah, it's, it's quite disgusting. And Mises said if if Regarding becoming a banker, he said, if you were smart, you wouldn't be. Hey, uh, so I've only been in Austria for three weeks now, two and a half weeks. So my limited understanding of Austrian economics is very much a focus on the individual and my own actions and what I want to get out of life and what I value. 
Um, you obviously know a lot more about the school. So do you see it more so as an individual approach to one's life or one's own economics or more broadly their life in general? Or do you see that there is room for practical implementation of these thoughts more broadly? Well, there's definitely room for practical implementation of these thoughts. The thing is with the Austrian school, it's like we're not policy advocates. What you have today with modern mainstream economics is we're going to make policy uh, and we're just going to like create the formula to show that, yeah, if we do this, we'll get the result we want to. But these are just apologists for the state, frankly. Um, you know, when I first got to Oxy, I wasn't an anarchist. I'm an anarchist now, thanks to him. <laughs> and I'm super proud of that. And I think for your personal spiritual development, that's all you. You have to pursue that path on your own. And um, as far as like leaving economics aside, if you you know want to be like a free individual, freedom, as Judge Andrew Napolitano says, comes from the human heart. So that's where it begins, and it works outward. And I think uh, you know society is just you and me. It's just two people. And those relationships, they do change. They get affected if, uh, if, if, if you wanted to, if you want to, you know, um, if you want to grow, if you want to be a better person, you can most definitely do that. And I think economics gives you the power to. Um, I want to make one more point regarding the economics of suicide. I think that this subject of suicide is most appropriate for praxeology. And if you're unfamiliar, praxeology is the science of human action. This is where economics comes from. And I can't even consider leaving the topic of suicide to any other field of study, considering like the sociologists, the critical theory and social justice people, um, any other field. They would fuck it up, frankly. And I think suicide is just uh, you know one choice among many for human actors, and so approaching it in that way, I think, kind of, uh, kind of is the most appropriate way to approach it. And then you know you can get into morality of it, but that to me is just values and what your beliefs are. And so, you know, I don't want anyone to commit suicide, but I don't think it's wrong to commit suicide. I think, I think you know, history has shown that that it's it's just the, as Mises said, it's radical resignation from life. In my perspective, it is one choice of values to alleviate the suffering someone may have. Also, this is what I'm going to look into further for for my research is um, there is this thing called MAID, medically assisted in death, and. This is a, something in Canada, but but uh, all socialized, you know, medicine countries have this. And this is actually what um, you can look up uh, a video on YouTube by Yuri Maltsev. He just passed away last week, but um, it's called "What Socialized Medicine Really Looks Like," and he talks about being from the Soviet Union, how medicine is the number one field for all socialists because. They understand that if they control the medicine, they control kind of your life. And if you don't own your life as John Locke, if you do own your life as John Locke said, then you're a free man. But when the state takes that over, they decide you know, who lives and who dies. And so you have this, um, this gross distortion where you have the health professionals putting people to death. So in Canada, an increase, significant increase in in medical assisted suicides occurred. And what I really think is going on is um, they call it dying with dignity. And I think because Canada can't have the proper medical uh, services for their, their people, what you have is these long waiting lines and people not getting the treatment they need because there's no market for it. I mean, the market finds a way, but the market is so distorted that it's like people aren't getting the services they need. And um, 
I think what happened was Canada is trying to push this idea that, hey, we can't help you and we have too many people, so you know, you're not an asset, you're a liability, and we want to get rid of our liabilities. And I think they're like trying to persuade people. I mean, it was, it, 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 it was like they want to have access for children without their parents' permission to have a death with dignity, which is like euthanasia. So I think they're putting people to, to death. I mean, this happened before. But this is what socialized medicine does. And I don't know if you guys are seniors or if you're in a senior seminar, but I took health, health economics, and that was, that was the most bullshit I've ever been fed. But uh, it was just like microeconomics, but we just labeled the units health. And you know, as we're showing, a single payer is better than a market for these services. But, but medicine is a normal good. The more money you have, the more you can demand. And when you distort that, you, you know, like for example, in the Soviet Union, the doctors, the medical professionals, got paid one third the salary of bus drivers. So, you know, and they don't even have prices, they have targets, and their targets are, uh, we want a full hospital, but with healthy people, because who can die, that's only sick people. So, you know, if you're over the age 65, they just give you aspirin until you go home, say hey, goodbye to your family. Um, things like that, it's just a completely distortion of, uh, of the society. And, I, and that's what, what, what socialism is. And I don't think capitalism is perfect, I mean, you have to deal with, you know, competition with winning and losing, and, and to be a loser, that's tough. How do you accept being a loser? Well, you, you just accept it, and, but not everyone wants to accept it. And, uh, you know, that's part of life. And um, that's, I, I mean, we have such a weird society right now in the US where, like, we think by some measure we're, we're sacred, we should, like, rule, we have these thoughts of democracy, like democratic thoughts, what does that even mean? Um, only less than 1% of all humans in all human history ever considered ideas of democracy. Uh, so this is a relatively new political institution that we're trying out. And um, yeah, I think to really, to really like try to open yourself to these ideas is, is, is existential in a way. But I think it, you kind of have to, not that you have to, you don't have to do anything, but um, if you want to be more free, I think you, you have to really look into this kind of stuff. Yes? How did you get interested in economics and suicide? Um, well, I mean, I don't know. Like, I guess, like, my own darkness, you know? Like, I was just, I was just trying to really understand death and, like, understand how, like, people die, like, that's so weird, um, but uh, a lot of it was, like, also understanding economics that, oh, economics isn't just, you know, understanding money and finance, it's about human civilization, and when you look at how civilization rises and falls, you see the inner workings of many aspects of society, and one aspect is the state, and, that, and that's, you know, the state is is this institution that isn't sacred. I mean, historically, it's been the church, uh, but now we, we've gone um, and a secular religion, which is the state. And uh, that's, I mean, this is what socialism is. It, it comes from the institution of the state and thinking we can provide things for nothing. But Say's Law says production precedes consumption. So it's just, uh, I don't know. I mentioned it in Spain to Huerta de Soto for my proposal for my master's research. And immediately he supported it too and was like, yeah, this is something um, very serious. And if you do a good job, you can do it for your PhD. And uh, so I'm trying to run with it. I mean, I, I, I don't know. Like, I, I kind of see, like, this is an area of investigation the Austrian school hasn't done much with. And I think I can do it. I don't know, it's just, it kind of sucks. Like, I'm putting my mind through this, but to me it's worth it. And I think that's, that's what, uh, that's what I want to do. 
and uh, investigating this. Yeah. Is it a little bit, you know, masochistic perhaps, but fuck it. <laughs> Talk about government structure. I know you're an anarchist, but what direction would you like to see, to say, like the U.S. go towards? If the U.S. go towards, you got change in a way that's yeah. not full anarchy. What direction would you like to see? I would want to see less imperialism. France, if you want to, you know, do some things, we can send an email. We don't have to have an embassy in every country. Uh, we think we need to like spread democracy, but what that means is we want everyone to play ball with the U.S. and we want to be the world leaders. And I don't think that's like a healthy idea to have of like we're going to try to rule people who are nothing like us. The best way, if you want to really have freedom in Iran, is to just keep doing what we're doing, which is making reality TV shows, blue jeans, you know, hip hop music, things like this, because. In Iran, they're, they're consuming this. They want to consume it. And you're having like a, a pro-freedom revolution over there. And that's kind of what happened with the Soviet Union was, um, you know, they started listening to the music and like getting new ideas and, and they were wanting to have blue jeans and stuff like that. I mean, they didn't have food. They literally thought there was more food in the Soviet Union than in the U.S., but they were lied to. Um, and I think Americans have to understand that, yeah, we're being lied to too. And you have to look at, like, how, are, how am I being lied to? For me, that just pisses me off. Like, Mary Rothbard had a sign above his desk, and I believe it said, hatred is my muse. And, you know, Austrians are amazing because, like, they're so friendly because they understand freedom and, and, and the implications of that. But truthfully, they're just anti-imperialists. They want to be left alone for the same reason that they don't want, you know, other people to be controlled because it's just not it's not right. It's just not right. And that's what democracy produces is like the people of Texas should have the right to rule over the people of Oregon or vice versa. And it's just like that idea alone is so far removed from like a healthy functioning uh, way to live. I mean unless you're an authoritarian, um, you know, try your best, but that's what I would like to see is less imperialism. Um, yeah, I just, uh, I'd want to see, you know, because it turns inward. And now the, the war on terror has turned inward. People think Trump supporters are racist. They think Trump's literally Hitler. Um, but, you know, Biden is no better on, in any measure, on immigration, on political prisoners. Uh, this, this is just like the system itself. It's not right and left. It's literally the system. And to, to some credit to Marx, Marx thought that there was like a class warfare between the bourgeoisie and the proletarians. But the class warfare is between the state, the producers, and the exploiters. The exploiters are not the middle class bourgeoisie. I mean, look, if I want you to cut my lawn and I give you $10 million for it, who's exploiting who? Right? So. That's just part of the market, is you know, people, entrepreneurs providing jobs for other people to have a living. I think that's that's okay. Like that's not bad. Um, but the state itself, like Mary Rothbard had the question um, in an essay, if there was a button in front of you and it would completely abolish the state, would you press it? And would you press it so hard that like you get a blister. Something like that. But uh, I don't know, yeah. As an anarchist, I just, I'm just over imperialism. You know, it's kind of this perspective of a, like a modern, postmodern perspective, um, whereas people in the 60s like really thought, yeah, we need to go save the Vietnamese from these ideas of communism. And then you look at it and it's just like, oh, oh, actually this is kind of like the American Revolution. Like, these people are fighting for their homeland, and these, these invaders are coming in and trying to, you know, assert their authority and dominance over these people. So things like that. Things like that. I want to see less of that. Yeah.
And also voting. Voting is so stupid. People have this sticker, I voted. But it's like, but voted for what? This you get in a market you get more choices. If I like one soda, there's 20 more similar flavors to try. But in elections, your choices dwindle right in front of you until you're left with people who are practically identical. And it's like, oh, do we want a 3% tax cut or a 3.2% tax cut? It's like, dude, yeah. So in that sense, also the spirituality of anarchism makes you apolitical. And there's value to that because in society today, many things have become politicized. The NFL is politicized. And to be apolitical, to walk away from those things and just not concern yourself with it, or not not concern yourself with it, but not let that concern you um, to the emotional extent that it does others, is very valid. I mean, I think watching the news, the legacy institutions, is just not healthy for people. Like, you're literally getting your ideas from what other people want you to think. You need to read books. You need to read history. You need to read some, some, some shit and open your mind. And that's why, that's why books are great. The Mises Institute has a great bookstore online if you want to read more about like history, economics, philosophy. Uh, that's a great catalog to look through for good books. You're not going to find it at Barnes and Nobles. I mean, I was in Barnes and Nobles the other day, and I looked like through the section on economics, and it's it's just the regurgitation of yeah. So that's why we need the state to have more spending here and for these people. And in a way, you know, Thaddeus Russell uses this word infantilization and parentalism of society. A lot of like, dude, you guys. I got ten minutes. Okay, you guys are are in college at Occidental. And even in my Spanish class, I remember my Spanish professor telling me, you know why you guys are really here, right? Because we're trying to spoon feed you guys communist propaganda and ideas of, of progressivism. So, so when you look at things like, oh, like everyone, you know, we need to protect these certain groups. And what that means is they don't have the autonomy to live life for themselves. Without us, the saviors, the, the rightly um, serious progressives, these groups of people would fall back into exploited slaves. And it's just kind of a beautiful thought in a way that, that you know, you are destined by God to save these groups of people, but what it means in reality is that, that these people can't do things on their own, and um, yeah, I don't know, I think, I think it's bullshit. Any more questions? Yes? I don't know how familiar you are with Oxy Ackerman, so I'm taking the CSLC class. Okay. It's like lots of Okay. Um, that partially discusses their time, and I just yesterday I started reading on source like uh, in my leadership. So I wanted to ask you if you think that the change in income brackets in, in let's say the middle class was the main factor for suicide in those days, or the inherent um, lack of wealth for the lower class? Well, the lack of wealth is interesting because if you look at countries who you know, can be considered third world or a lack of wealth, the suicide rates aren't, they don't stand up. If you look at the suicide rates, it's mostly like the first world countries that are leading in suicide. So I, I think uh, going to, sorry, what was the first part? The middle income? Yeah, it's the change of, of change income. Um, yeah, I think, I think the change of income has a lot to do with it because people can kind of like get established and figure out life from their, you know, quote unquote, income bracket. But Durkheim looks at like, oh, when these people go up, and even more income, they're like thrown off. Like they don't know how to process it. And so there's like more suicides there that he finds. And I think also going from the middle to like being impoverished also affects people. But it's interesting because he looks at the low income people and it's like there's not many suicides going on there, relatively. Um, yeah, yeah, something, something more.
Yeah, I was just as an anarchist, like, um, my question would be more like, so if you, if you believe in anarchy, do you need that to be a worldwide phenomenon? For example, like if we were anarchists here in the United States, but China wasn't, doesn't that leave us to set, like, national defense becomes a problem, and I want to hear, like, kind of how you would approach that. Because sure. I, I, like, I, like, I, there's some essence in, like, there's an argument to be made that we have to have some sort of national defense order to protect the free market. Sure. And I want to hear your take. Okay. Uh, there's five minutes left, so I'll, I'll answer it. Uh, anarchy is a relationship. Between you and me right now, this is an anarchist relationship. No one's compelling us to be here other than Professor Georgian, but if we're outside, it's really uh, by our own voluntary will do we come together, have a peaceful conversation or relationship. And when you look at how you know the world reaches anarchy, it, it's not a top-down phenomenon. It's not like the whole world comes together. It's the small groups. You have a free market city. This model is great. It's prosperous. It's replicated elsewhere. And people look at, oh, the institution at the top of the state is really the ones who's inefficient here. So we can do without them. And it would be panarchy, where you have all different political types of organizations that coexist with each other. Um, but anarchy can occur in small cities. And you can have alliances. So for example, every country in the world today is in a relationship of anarchy. There's no one world government over everyone. If there is an incident with, you know, an American murders a Canadian in Mexico, there's a way to solve that. How? I'm not sure. But the fact that these things can be resolved um, implies that that order is a function of, of human uh, desire for, for order. You gotta remember, anarchy is a type of order. It's the A and the O, anarchic order. And this order is not statism. It's not saying, oh, we need this territorial monopoly on this specific land. And you do need defense, of course, but you don't need you know, this uh, national defense of of like one company supplying it. And then, did you know the Department of Defense? In like 1942, it changed its name. Before that, it was the Department of War. And if you have an institution, you know, of, of the state, it's gonna do its function, like cause wars. Things like, I don't know what your change is saying, but it was called the Department of War. So what you want is defense, you don't want war. I mean, I'm anti-war, but war can be necessary to mitigate Things uh, that are worse than, than, I guess, I don't know what's worse than more, but anyways, um, yeah, it's just more like it starts small scale and then begins with one city and then we'll kind of take this cycle. Basically, you know, prior to 1965, before slavery was abolished in the West, if you thought 20 years prior to that, that like slavery was going to go away, You'd be looked at as like a madman. Be like, dude, slavery's been around for thousands of years. It's not going away. And now it's like, oh, slavery was abolished, and that's great. That's a huge step for human freedom and prosperity. But we still have some tangential form of slavery, and this is what the state is. It's slavery on the leash. They said, yeah, you're free, but you have to pay me money, or else you're going in the cage. And that's that's not good enough for freedom. Freedom is incompatible with this concept of statism or, or democracy, for that matter. And um, when we abolish the state, when you have you know companies that provide security as 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 an asset rather than a liability, then you have a, the next major step for human freedom. And it's you know it solves one thing, but it doesn't solve everything. There's still going to be horrible incidents that occur. But this is like solving cancer. It's one huge main issue. There's going to be other diseases to concern yourself with. That. So, if I can leave you with one message, read more pieces than most. Thank you for your time.